Hi, it's Steve Hargadon, and we are deep in day two, hard to believe, of Library 2.013. Uh, Peter Morville is here as a special keynote speaker. Welcome, Peter. Thanks. It's great to be here. Thank you so much for taking the time. We want to thank our conference sponsors and supporters. I think Sandy, Dr. Sandy Hirsch is in the room. Thanks to San Jose State University for their uh, terrific support and for being the founding partner of the conference. Thanks to Follow It, um, Blackboard Collaborate, and EdWeb, and all of our great conference partners. This is a chance for those of you who are in the room participating live to indicate where you're participating from. Look to the left of the map. You're looking for the star icon. You can click on it twice and then click on the map. It's fun if you put a note in the chat as well. Let us know state, country, time, temperature, anything you think we might, might find interesting. It really is fun for me always to see international participants. Please continue to put those notes in the chat, but in order to give uh, as much time to our keynote speaker, I'm going to move us forward and turn the time over to him. Thank you so much. Thanks, Steve, and thanks to all of you folks for, for being here. Uh, I've got a lot of ground to cover, so I'm just going to dive right in, uh, a quick intro, and then right into the, the meat of the talk. Um, I have posted these slides on SlideShare, uh, and so you'll be able to access the slides afterwards if you want to refer back, and I'll pop the URL in there. So uh, we are going to talk about information architecture and inspiration architecture. Uh, but first, a couple of notes about my background. So my academic background is in library and information science. I'm one of those crazy librarians who uh, fell in love with the internet back in the early 1990s. And it's worth taking a moment to remember that uh, that was a different internet. Those were the early days. It was an internet where nobody knew you were a dog. Uh, these days we're all kind of tracked and everyone knows who you are. But uh, it was an internet of, of great hope uh, and promise. And you know, we've come far enough now in the last 20 years to, uh, you know, we've seen some amazing accomplishments and, and amazing progress on the internet. And we've also seen the dark side uh, of the internet. And so I, I think we're at an interesting time now where we're able to reflect on, you know, what's going well and what's going maybe in a direction we don't like. In any case, uh, most of my career has been spent outside the walls of libraries, uh, helping a wide variety of organizations with their information architecture and, and user experience challenges. And along the way, I've written a number of animal books uh, about information architecture and ambient findability and search. And I'm going to touch on each of these topics today, and, and I hope, as you'll see by the end, um, each of these topics and the, the, the notion of the, you know, the future of libraries, they're all, uh, it's hard to talk about one without the other because they're all hopelessly intertwined. I would like to take a moment to thank Joe James. Uh, he, uh, invited me a year ago to contribute a chapter to his book, uh, Library 2020, and that sort of chapter uh, called Inspiration Architecture was really the, the seed that has grown into this talk. So let's get started. Um, I want to talk about information architecture, and then I want to explain why information architecture is not enough. Back in the 90s, we defined information architecture as the, the structural design of shared information environments. Um, and while that's a fairly expansive way of, of defining the term, 
most people came to see information architecture as being about websites, organizing and structuring websites for findability. And that was a good way to frame information architecture at the time, but it has limitations and I think it, you know, that framing is part of why our community has been struggling with definitions ever since. In fact, we even have a hashtag defining the damn thing. So we, we struggle a lot with how to define or explain what we do and I think that that has been a productive struggle because what we're aiming towards is more of a medium independent way of explaining what we do. It's not just about websites. So let me offer one uh, example that I like. Uh, Jorge Arango, who is actually an, an architect turned information architect, explains that where architects use forms and spaces to design environments for inhabitation, information architects use nodes and links to create environments for understanding. I think that phrase, environments for understanding, is important and uh, we'll return to that uh, as we go forward. So that's a fairly abstract explanation. Let's kind of look at a, a specific example here, a, a brief case study from some of my work with the Library of Congress. I uh, have had the, the honor and privilege of working with the library over the period of several years. Uh, and the funny thing is that, that our relationship got off to a, a rocky start. I was invited to uh, do an evaluation of the library's web presence and after doing my research I decided to argue that the library's web presence was like the Winchester Mystery House. Now, for those of you not familiar with this, uh, the Winchester Mystery House is a well-known California mansion that was under continuous construction for 38 years. Apparently the widow who lived there had been told by a psychic that when construction was complete, she would drop dead. So she kept having room after room built. And by the end there were hundreds of rooms and windows and doorways and staircases and no blueprint. Now it's not an unattractive house and the, room, the view from any particular room isn't unusual, but it's a findability nightmare. And I argued that that was the state of the library's web presence, right? Through fragmentation into many websites and domains and identities, uh, they had a situation where users didn't know which site to go to for which purpose. So I wrote up my report and I flew out to Washington DC for a series of meetings with various groups at the library. And when I got there I, I was told that I wasn't going to be meeting with these groups because my report had been embargoed. It was viewed as too sensitive, it would upset a lot of people and what was really nice is the folks said, you know what, we, we agree with you, <laughs> we see this as a problem, it needs to be fixed. but..." We have to be careful about how we sort of disseminate this. So I was a little disappointed. I, I kept working with the library in the, the next several months on smaller projects. And during that time, this report started to percolate throughout the library and eventually made its way up to the senior uh, management, to the executive committee. And, and they made a very sort of courageous decision that we need to change the way we work on the web. And they said, well, you know, why don't we bring this guy who told us about all the problems back and see if he can help with some solutions. So uh, they formed a web governance board with representatives from all of the major units of the library. And I worked with that board, first of all, to flush out a web strategy, a sort of a big picture, uh, what are we going to do on the web approach. And then we moved into uh, the development of, of lots of very detailed wireframes for all of the major interfaces for the three major websites of the library. This is where a lot of the most tangible detail work happened. And there are a lot of little things that we did to make things better. Um, an example here, uh, 
simply defaulting the search results to materials that are available online because the vast majority of visitors to the website are not going to visit the physical library. So we're, we're making sure that they see uh, digitized materials that they can get access to. And we see the faceted navigation interface running down the left hand side. That was sort of a major step forward. And I want to return to that, that phrase, uh, the, the, you know, the architecture of understanding. Faceted navigation works really well because it presents a, a custom map to your search results. Users have entered a query, they see some sample results, but they also see there on the left, here's, here's, here's sort of a map to my results and, and here are some simple steps forward to narrow my query. So faceted navigation helps people to understand what they've found and then to take a next step. So I did a lot of detailed work on wireframes and interfaces, but I think some of the most important work was really more about education and communication. Helping folks at the library to recognize that search isn't just about an interface or an engine, that at its best, search is a complex adaptive system with feedback loops that enable iterative and ongoing learning. And to understand that while the home page is important, search is absolutely critical as a glue that connects that home page to findable social objects. And also to recognize that those objects serve as not only a destination, but as a gateway. Because in the library's case, the vast majority of users are not coming through the home page, they're coming through a Google search. So how do we design those objects as gateways, entrances into the library and its collections? Now, it's worth pausing a moment to, to, to sort of recognize that uh, this project could never have happened without the engagement of the executive committee of the library. When I was first brought in, it was by somebody in sort of the middle management layer at the library. And while we were able to articulate the problems, there was absolutely no clear path towards a solution. We didn't have the authority or the buy-in to move forward. It really took uh, engagement at the highest levels of the library to make this information architecture redesign possible. And that's something I've been seeing on more and more of my projects, uh, that it's, it's increasingly difficult to do information architecture without engaging in governance and culture. So I'm going to kind of wrap up on this information architecture section and um, just to sort of point you folks, if you're interested in learning a little bit more about information architecture and its evolution and where it's headed, uh, I created a Prezi called Understanding IA. Uh, you can find it pretty easily via my website or Google, uh, Google on Understanding IA and you'll find it. Uh, we don't have time to take a look now, but, but maybe take a look later. So last year, I decided uh, that given that we're starting to frame information architecture as being about understanding, I should dig a little deeper into what do, what do we mean by understanding and how do we teach for understanding. One of the first things I found was, uh, just want to make sure that things went kind of quiet on the chat and I heard a ding. Are, are we all okay in terms of folks being able to hear? Yes, you're just great. Uh, that ding probably was somebody accidentally raising their hand, but you're doing okay. fine. Okay, thanks. Now we're not hearing you, so maybe you turned your microphone off. There we go, thanks. So, one of the first things I found when I began my research was uh, 
some work done at the Harvard School of Education. Uh, uh, Project Zero is one of the names for this, this work. And uh, they talk about the importance of performances of understanding. Right? When you're teaching, how do you know if your students are understanding? Well, you invite them to do performances of understanding. And I think that this, this picture actually you know, wonderfully illustrates what a performance of understanding might look like. Now, there's been a lot of talk about the fact that much of the teaching that goes on today is not teaching for understanding. It's teaching for memorization. Uh, there's a, uh, a YouTube video, it was a TED talk by Sir Ken Robinson called Changing Paradigms, and he argues that education is modeled on the interests of industrialization and in the image of it. Our schools are factories churning out students in batches by age. It's a powerful video and it's worth taking a look at. Um, but I think it, it, it's missing something. And, and, and much of the hype around the idea of technology changing education is, is missing something. When we hear from Khan Academy about flipping the classroom or from the MOOCs, Coursera and Udacity and edX about these massively online, massively open online courses. Uh, you know, when we hear about Nicholas Negroponte's group uh, air dropping tablets into Ethiopian villages. What I hear are some great ideas that are exciting, but we're hearing from technologists who don't know that much about teaching. And the way I see the situation, we have a lot of teachers who don't know much about technology. We have a lot of technologists who don't know much about teaching. What we really need are people to bring these folks together. We need acts of synthesis to figure out how to bring the best of both worlds together. We need to kind of go from the parts to the whole. Speaking of which, one of the best books I found during, during this research into education is called Making Learning Whole, in which the author, David Perkins, starts out with a, a brief story from his childhood. And he says, when I was playing baseball, most of the time I wasn't playing full scale, four bases, nine innings. I was playing a perfectly suitable junior version of the game. But when I was studying those shards of math and history, I wasn't playing a junior version of anything. It was like batting practice without knowing the whole game. Why would anyone want to do that? I think that's a really interesting question and what we should be thinking about in our sort of teaching and learning roles is how do we help people to play a junior version of the game uh, that we're, we're sort of aiming for? How do we help them to understand not just what are you doing, but why? How do we help people to see the whole So when I was um, taking a look at Khan Academy not long after reading that book, I took a look at this example uh, tutorial, and it does a really nice job of explaining how to calculate the area of a circle. But it doesn't help you understand why. Why would I ever need to calculate the area of a circle? And I think that they, they should be taking that next step. They should be sort of helping people to see the whole, to understand not just how do you do this, but why might you need to know this? Now, the single best book I found in my research was Disrupting Class by Clayton Christensen, author of The Innovator's Dilemma. And he does a wonderful job of just explaining the overall landscape of education, and how technology is disrupting it at the moment. But what he does is he argues that, he talks quite a bit about the MOOCs. And he says, you know, the MOOCs suck. But they suck in the same way that the early Apple computers sucked when compared to the IBM mainframe. And he explains that the first job of these MOOCs is not to compete with higher education, with K-12 education directly. 
It's to compete with non-consumption, to get these educational opportunities out to places, to people who would, simply wouldn't have access any other way. But then he warns or cautions that uh, as momentum starts to build, there's, the, there's the, the significant chance that the MOOCs are going to start to, uh, you know, really gain momentum and, and, and transform the traditional educational landscape. So we need to be careful not to write them off too early to recognize that they're starting to build up steam and, and to really be looking at ways in which we can, we can leverage them. Now one of the nice things about all of this technology provocation is that it invites us to reimagine the architecture of a class. For instance, classroom clickers get us to think more deeply about uh, interaction and evaluation. How do we make sure that we're pausing to, to see if the students are understanding what we're talking about? How do we uh, engage them in conversation and peer-to-peer -peer collaboration uh, when they're not? Khan Academy's notion of the flipped classroom, the idea of the lecture at home and homework in school gets us thinking about how do we engage not just the teacher, but peers in helping one, you know, helping one another to get that, to, to solve those difficult homework problems. And then we have the learning management system, tools like Blackboard and Moodle. These are wonderful opportunities for librarians and teachers to work together. Right? This is the point of need. Uh, specific to a course that students are taking, here's where we can make librarians and library resources available to students. And I'll return to that notion. So all of these ideas were churning around in my head last year when I uh, was invited to do a consulting project with Harvard Library. And we started out with a project to create kind of a, an umbrella portal to all of the libraries that are part of the Harvard system and to make it really easy to find a library and to then access its resources. But this project left a major problem unsolved. It's a problem that's common to most libraries, academic and public, which is we're forcing our patrons, our users, to know, before they can ask a question, they have to know which database the answer is in. And very often we're presenting hundreds of databases and saying, go ahead, try to find it. Well, we know what most students do when faced with that challenge. They go to Google, which is simple and easy to use and works good enough. It certainly has its strengths, but tools like Google Scholar also have some major weaknesses. And I think we're doing our patrons and ourselves a disservice in relying on these tools. We're starting to see the results of this, uh, these problems. Uh, in, in, in recent graduates. Employers are increasingly complaining that college, you know, recent college graduates don't really know how to search. They only know how to do a quick superficial query via Google. So we're not teaching these students the skills they need to succeed in the workplace. There was an interesting study a couple of years back that showed that faculty faculty's perspective on the role of the library is changing. The library as a gateway to knowledge, that perspective or role is decreasing and, and the library as a buyer or purchasing agent is increasing. Well, this means the, the library is increasingly being disintermediated from the discovery process and, and risking irrelevance in one of its core functional areas. This is definitely something to be concerned about. Well, one, one 
part of the solution is to, is to try to move towards a more Google-like experience to sort of aim for a single search box to all library resources, all scholarly materials that are available via a university or via a community. And believe me, I know that's easier said than done. But a number of academic libraries have been working hard to solve this problem. There's a couple of different interface approaches to try to present results. We've got uh, the more federated search approach with a bento box presentation. And here's some articles, here's some books, here's some databases that might have information relevant to your query. This approach has some advantages, but its big disadvantage is it's a bit confusing. Right? This is not a typical search results interface. This is not what users are expecting. It forces them to do some work, which isn't all bad, but it may make them go back to Google. Another approach which I prefer is to move to more of an aggregated, unified index that supports faceted navigation, right, where we've got that custom map to your search results on the left that bridges multiple formats as well as languages and locations and so forth. And there are a number of libraries working hard on that. Faceted navigation works well in part because users are increasingly familiar with it. It's how they shop. Faceted navigation has been shown to work so well that it's become nearly ubiquitous in e-commerce over the last decade. Right? These are organizations where their livelihood is completely uh, dependent on users' ability to find what they're looking for. And they've invested enormous amounts of money exploring lots of different interfaces and have ended up with faceted navigation. And it's worth noting that this is a very powerful way of enabling people to understand what they found and, and then refine or narrow what they're looking for. Uh, Amazon presents a nice example of, of what's called adaptive facets. When I start searching on Amazon at the highest level, I get a very limited set of facets because there's not much metadata that's common across all product categories. But when I get down to digital cameras, now I'm, now I'm offered the ability to narrow by megapixels. Right? So we should be thinking about what are some of those adaptive facets uh, that are relevant maybe to library formats, facets that we surface when you get deep enough. And there's quite a bit of research that's been, been done to show that uh, when, you, when you offer students that single search box, they use it. And it encourages them to really dig deeper into full text content, to actually use the scholarly resources that we're making available. Now, it's worth reminding ourselves that this is not just about a single search box on the library's home page. We should be thinking about search as a service. There are many points of origin, starting points, where users want to begin to search. So an important one that I mentioned earlier is at the course level. Right? When you're in that learning management system or a libguide, or a course pack. That's where we can provide a portal into all of the resources that the library is making available to you. So we might think of an embeddable search widget, right? the single search box for your course, for information that's relevant to the subject at hand. If you provide that, we're going to, we're going to see a sort of a skyrocketing usage of library resources. Now, there are clearly some technological barriers to moving forward towards that vision of a single search box. 
But it's worth noting that there are also some major cultural barriers, whether it's among librarians or senior faculty or administration. And again, as I mentioned earlier, I'm seeing more and more in my information architecture work as websites and mobile apps become more interconnected with the business of the organization. Politics come into play in a big way. And so if we're going to do this work, we really need to recognize, uh, we need to understand corporate and university and academic culture and figure out whether there are opportunities to change that culture or to align with that culture in order to move forward. I will say that if libraries don't solve this problem, somebody else will. The MOOCs are one candidate. Right now they're offering these courses, free courses to anyone anywhere in the world, but their students have no access to library resources. Right? They're off campus, they're not part of an institution. They have no ability to follow up on something the, the professor said and, and dig into some, some scholarly materials related to that topic. So a single search box for each course that's part of a MOOC would be a major step forward and maybe a big business opportunity for these folks. I'm not sure who's going to solve this problem, but we need to start moving forward. We can't allow everybody to simply rely on Google and the, the fast food searching behavior of users because we have major problems with information literacy. We have not just a gap, but an information literacy gulch in our society. And of course, information literacy isn't just about finding information. It's about evaluating, creating, and organizing and using information. We're all painfully familiar with the growing income gap in many of our societies around the world. And I would argue that the information literacy gulch is just making this worse. Uh, as somebody who's been to library school, who's spent their life career on the internet, I'm really good at searching and evaluating and, and synthesizing information. But many people aren't. And they're not able to take advantage of information in order to make better decisions about their health, about finance, about every aspect of their life. And what this does is it, it widens the income gap and it also decreases quality of life and even lifespan. So I think that this is a really important problem that we need to start figuring out how to solve. I actually gave a version of this talk earlier this week in London, and I had the opportunity to uh, take a train out to Oxford and run a mile on the Ithley Road track, which is pictured here today. It's, it's the track where Roger Bannister in, I think, 1954 broke the four-minute barrier. He, he was the first person to ever run a mile in under four minutes. It had been thought to be an unbreakable barrier. Well, a few years back, I was reading a book about this uh, accomplishment, and it, what was interesting is there were, there were three men, one in England, one in the United States, one in Australia, who are all competing to break the four minute barrier at exactly the same time. And it struck me as I read this book that, that this accomplishment wasn't just about athletics. It wasn't just about uh, working really, really hard towards a goal. It was about information. This was a time when information sharing had gone global. And in connection with the scientific method, people were learning how to train to run fast. It wasn't that long before that athletes had been having their spleens removed because people thought that would make them run faster. Now this was an operation that had zero efficacy and a one in five chance of death. So in many ways, information in connection with science has helped us make many advances. It's why we've been getting better in so many areas over the last 50, 60, 70 years. 
But on the other hand, when I look at some of the problems that surround us, I think we've started running backwards. Take health care in the United States, for instance. It's riddled with problems. Uh, there's some really serious challenges. And, you know, back pain, for instance, large percentage of humans experience severe back pain. It results in tens of thousands of surgeries. Uh, and there's a secret about MRIs uh, that uh, very often when, when surgeons say we need to go in and, and do surgery uh, because there's a problem, um, those same problems are seen in the, in, in the MRIs of healthy people. Now we could go on and on about why medicine is a mess at the moment um, from the complexity of our minds and bodies uh, to just, just sort of cultural issues uh, to business and advertising and, and the, the kind of corruption uh, that's becoming increasingly endemic to society. And I do agree with Larry Lessig that uh, at a certain point we can only make so much progress without dealing with the root problem. Um, but I'm not going to go too far into that today. Um, what I want to do is suggest that this is also about culture. Uh, when, I had, when I was writing Ambient Findability seven or eight years ago, my back started to hurt. And it became a severe chronic problem. And I'd been to the doctor and she, you know, she gave me some exercises to try and she had me popping painkillers, uh, you know, three pills three times a day. And it wasn't doing any good. And I finally got desperate and I, I searched on the internet for back pain and stress. And I found this book called Healing Back Pain, The Mind-Body Connection by John Sarno. And he talks in depth about uh, the, the mind-body connection, the sort of the psychosomatic origin of a lot of pain that people are suffering. And to make a long story short, he cured my back almost overnight. Reading this book helped me to remove the pain permanently. And I wrote about this in Ambient Findability. And over the years, I've had lots of wonderful feedback about the book, but nobody has ever come up to me and said, you know, I, I, I was really interested in that passage about your back. And I think the reason for that is that nobody believes me. People read that section and just keep moving, kind of dismissing it. And yet it was one of the biggest kind of uh, mind-changing things that I've ever been through. And I, I think the barrier is culture, right? We are programmed by our cultures to see things with blinders on. We're only open to a certain sort of spectrum of possibility. And I think it's a really interesting question, you know, what are the limits of information given the cultures that we uh, are part of? This isn't a new idea. Um, Calvin Morris back in 1959, uh, he talked about the limits of information and the idea that Many people don't want information. Um, and in fact, they'll avoid using a system precisely because it gives them information. Information can be hard and painful and make us have to redo or rethink. So what can we do when we reach the limits of information, when simply giving people more information won't change minds or behavior? Well. Winston Churchill had it right when he said, we shape our buildings thereafter they shape us. There's a lot we can do with architecture and environment to change behavior. This book, Nudge, provides a lot of examples of that. Uh, nudging people in the right direction by changing their environment, or in this case, changing the order of food in the cafeteria line. There's a lot of nudging going on on the web today. 
and it's the folks who figured out uh, the kind, you know, this sort of nudging, for instance, uh, a default sort by featured homes here on a real estate search site. The folks who figured this out are the ones who can actually afford these homes. Right? There's a lot of money to be made by nudging. But I would argue there's a lot of opportunity to improve um, people's understanding and decision making uh, and really make the world a better place by nudging sometimes in the other direction. So what else can we do uh, to affect change? Well, intervention at the level of habit can be extremely powerful. This book argues that, we, that there are some habits, what they call keystone habits, that have the power to start a chain reaction. Right? That we, success doesn't depend on getting every single thing right. If we can only identify a few key priorities and fashion them into powerful levers. They explain that willpower is the single most important keystone habit for individual success. Uh, willpower has been shown to be more, much more of a predictor of academic success than IQ. Uh, and it's interesting to note that this is part of why exercise is also a keystone habit. When we make ourselves get out there and run a mile or two every day, we're not just developing our muscles, we're developing our willpower, we're developing discipline. And that has a spillover effect into all other areas of our lives. They presented a wonderful case study um, in which Paul O'Neill, who became the CEO of Alcoa, very, very large global company, he decided that he wanted to focus on habits surrounding worker safety. And in order to change those habits, he had to change the culture. During his first public speech, he explained to mostly an audience of financial analysts, I want to talk to you about worker safety. I intend to make Alcoa the safest company in America. I intend to go for zero injuries. Well, the financial analysts were confused because they didn't really see the connection between worker safety and making more money. And the employees mostly ignored him, right? We don't necessarily trust to believe what this new CEO says. Well, several months into his tenure, an employee was killed on the job due to an accident. And he got the, the phone call late at night and, and immediately flew out to that location and had all the senior management fly out too. And the next morning, he gave a speech and he said, we killed this man. It's my failure of leadership. I caused his death. And it's the failure of all of you in the chain of command. Well, it was a powerful speech where he took responsibility and then he followed up, engaging in conversations with employees and working hard to make it so this would never happen again. And, and employees started to take notice. And over time, he was able to transform the company, make it a much safer place and affect the bottom line of the organization. On a more local level, there's a, a story with some similarities uh, at my public library. Um, several years back when Josie Parker took over as the director of the Ann Arbor District Library, she was hired in the wake of a financial scandal surrounding the library that really, you know, resulted in a loss of trust throughout the community. And one of the ways she addressed this is by promoting what she called a culture of generosity. And this showed in ways big and small over the years. Uh, in, in big ways, the library has, has, has designed and built some wonderful new library branches in our community. Um, in Ann Arbor, some of the most beautiful buildings are our branch libraries. But we've also seen, seen this culture of generosity in very small ways. For instance, games you can play during the summer where if you read a certain number of books, then you get the forgiveness of your library fines. Right? The library is sort of giving money back to you. And it's really, I think, 
you know, resulted in a, a very positive feeling about the library. Well, there's also a personal component to this, this success story. Uh, a couple of years back, Josie was uh, volunteering at a local bookstore, uh, helping to wrap presents uh, as part of a, a sort of a charity and fundraising drive at Christmas time. And a thief grabbed the donation box and started to run out of the bookstore. And Josie chased after him and was able to sort of grab him, stop him. He, he got away, but, uh, but dropped the, the, the donation jar. And Josie, unfortunately, was injured in the process. She fractured her leg. But this became a national news story with the headline, The Librarian Who Saved Christmas. This, you know, this is sort of an example of where, you know, uh, through personal, a personal act of leadership, she was able to contribute to that cu cultural transformation that really helps the organization move forward. So speaking of, you know, inspiring stories, uh, I was really inspired a few years ago when I watched the documentary by Ken Burns about America's national parks. This is a case where, you know, over the years, a number of individuals were tremendously courageous and willing to risk their careers, their lives, their health uh, in order to stand up against business interests, money and power, and, and defend the wilderness, to preserve the wilderness for future generations. Very inspiring stories uh, of how national parks came to be. And I think that there are similarities between libraries and national parks. In Inspiration Architecture, I argued a library like a national park teaches us that we all benefit when our most valuable treasures are held in common. Now let's go back for a moment to this notion of keystones. We talked about keystone behaviors or habits. Well, the term comes from architecture. There's a keystone uh, in, in arches, right? A central stone at the summit of an arch that locks the whole together. And it's a term that has been generalized and used in many contexts. For instance, we know that polar bears are a keystone species in the Arctic ecosystem. They have a far bigger impact on the whole ecosystem than many realize. And I think that's true of libraries. Libraries are keystones of culture. They, they, they are much more important to our society as a whole than many people realize. This is not a new idea. Back in 1889, Andrew Carnegie nailed it when he said, a library outranks any other one thing a community can do to benefit its people. It is a never failing spring in the desert. So it's not a new idea, but I think it's an idea we need to fight for today because it's, in, it's at risk. John Palfrey, who's been very active with creating the Digital Public Library of America, argued that too many people think that we don't need libraries when we have the internet. At the beginning, I mentioned the, the, the fact that the Internet's been around long enough now. We've started to see the dark side of the Internet. We've seen, we've gained a lot, but we've started to see what we've lost. In Ann Arbor, we no longer have a newspaper. And we lost Borders Books and Music, our big bookstore. So we're gaining, but we're also losing. I think that libraries are at risk, and, and now is a time when we need to really help people to understand the full value of the library. Now, one of the ways in which libraries are different from national parks, right? With a national park, all we need to do is preserve the wilderness. We need to maintain what, what's already there. But when we look at the future of libraries, we need to be constantly in the process of renewal. We need to create the future of libraries. In part, it's a challenge of architecture. 
in part it's a challenge of information architecture. We need to work towards that single search box that provides universal access to the materials at hand. We need to make the user experience better. But that's not enough. Information architecture isn't enough. We also need to inspire people. We need to lift them up to help everybody remember how amazing it is that we have this potential as humans to create and share knowledge to help people understand and to make better decisions. And so what we really need are inspiration architects. We need acts of inspiration architecture. We need to engage people at a deep, profound level in building the future of libraries. And I'm hoping that some of you folks are going to take on that challenge and help move us forward. So with that, I'm going to take a drink of water and a deep breath. Uh, and uh, I want to thank you all for your attention. And uh, maybe see if uh, we have any questions or comments in the chat room. Thank you so much, Peter, for a very inspirational talk. Um, we have a few minutes left to take questions either in the chat or on the microphone. I've opened it up. So for those of you who may be unfamiliar, if you have a microphone, press the talk button, and we will be able to hear you. Um, I look forward to hearing some comments. While we're waiting for people to write down some things, I did notice in the chat earlier that um, several people were very interested in the whole context incorporated with learning. Um, and that generated um, a bit of discussion. A couple comments are being written, so we'll wait till they um, come in. Um, Peter, I don't know if you can read in the chat. Um, one says, I was wondering how you think libraries with low numbers of staff can approach um, this level. Yeah, so um, I, I do think that a lot of times solutions don't require a lot of technology or money. Sometimes it's simply an act of reaching out uh, in the context of education, uh, a, a librarian reaching out to a teacher or a professor and, and, and talking about how can we work better together in order to help students find the resources they need and, and integrate uh, library resources into the, the curriculum. Uh, you know, I, I, I think that a lot of times the problems are at that human level where there's a little bit of mistrust or, uh, you know, a sense of this is my turf. And so all of us can do a better job of, of sort of reaching out or of just being accessible, making, making sure people recognize that we're approachable uh, so that we can kind of collaborate across disciplines and roles. And there's a funny question here. Did um, completing your book alleviate your back pain? Um, fortunately, I didn't have to wait the next four or five months to, to finish the book. Um, like I said, I literally reading that book, I had to read that book two or three times until I trusted it enough. Uh, and and it, it fully cured my back pain. So anyone who's suffering from chronic pain, I invite you to read that book. Uh, it, 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 it doesn't fit nicely into our kind of Western view of medicine. Um, but for me, it, it really changed my life. We have time for one more question that I see in the chat. Um, it's, do you have suggestions and how to get individuals who may not be yet involved in their library to be part of the profound process of building libraries as potential community stakeholders? Uh, 
We don't have your microphone on, Peter. Sorry about that. Um, so it's a good question. I'm not sure I'm fully quali qualified to answer that because I'm not from within the library community myself. But on the other side, maybe I am because giving this talk, starting to talk with librarians is, you know, uh, uh, is one of the things that, that I feel that I can do to try to kind of build bridges, to show, to make connections. Um, you know, I think that coming from outside of libraries, I have, I'm in a good position to talk about the value of libraries um, without, without the perception of bias. And I think that we can all, you know, kind of work towards helping ourselves and one another understand what is the library. It's not just a place for books. Uh, it's not just about any particular format or technology. Uh, in part, it's about coming together as a community and, and sharing, right? Holding something valuable in common and recognizing that not everything can be solved uh, by capitalism, uh, by e-commerce, and by the web. Uh, and I think with, with that, I'll, uh, again, thank you very much for your attention and, and hope everybody has a good day. And thank you, Peter, uh, very much for the presentation, thought-provoking, and thank you to all our participants for joining in today's session. Uh, I hope you will have time to go into some of the other sessions that we have through uh, the next few hours.